Hello and welcome to jasonnewland.com. My name is Jason Newland and this is Stop Smoking Relaxation Hypnosis. Please only listen when you can safely close your eyes. Now, I'm going to be making quite a few different recordings over the coming months and years, I guess. Because the way I see it is not every technique or specific recording is going to be either useful or enjoyable or um, usable by everybody. So it's nice to have a selection, nice to have a choice, because stopping smoking is a choice. Even, you know, technically it's not a choice because we all have to stop smoking eventually. Everyone that smokes is going to have to stop if they don't choose to stop. But it's still a choice, even for someone that has been told by a doctor that you have to stop immediately or else. You know, that kind of scenario still a choice ultimately it's up to you when and how you choose to make those changes in your life now if you don't want to stop you know if you you know some people only stop because their partner or you know, it's maybe some to, some people stop for other people. So if that's the case, then maybe go and do something else. Turn this off. Because you need to listen to this only if you're serious about stopping. And it's because you want to, for you. Now... You know, other people, stopping for other people is a secondary gain. You know, the benefit to other people, you know, getting to see your children grow up and not having them go through the suffering of maybe losing you early or, you know, whatever the situation might be. So, you know, there's lots of benefits to other people as well. But this is about you. This is this is about how you feel and what you want for yourself. This recording is not about other people. It's just about you. So, I got this little technique that I thought of. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't like being told what to do. I really don't like my stomach grumbling when I'm making a recording, but it is. Just had something, to, just had something to eat, and for some reason, my stomach's not satisfied with that. So, if someone tells you to do something or not to do something. I don't know how you react, but I I personally don't like it. Now, technically, if you're listening to this, you've given me permission to tell you what to do. In a kind of a, a weird way. I mean, of course, I can't just tell you, do this, do that, and you'll go and do it. But it's very focused, you know. You're listening to this, you know it's about smoking. You know it's about stopping smoking. 
for your health and for other reasons. I mean, I don't really need to bore you with that side of things. All the health benefits. We all know that. We all know that cigarettes are not good for us. We all know that every one of us has known someone that's died from cancer, whether it's smoke-related or not. We all know people, you know, it's, you haven't got to live to be very old to have someone die from, you know, a smoke-related illness. And right from a childhood, seeing it on television, and you know, so no, nobody, I don't think really over the age of about five years old, can really say that they didn't know that smoking was harmful to a human being. We all know that. So you don't really need to have someone tell you about all the bad things connected to cigarettes we know that we're not stupid are we you don't need me to tell you about the benefits of stop smoking we know the benefits we know that you're going to feel better you're going to feel healthier you may live longer you'll be able to breathe easier maybe all that stuff it's not boring but it's boring to hear it over and over again it's important, but you know that. You don't need anybody to tell you that. And if you're listening to this and you've been maybe smoking for a while, you'll have stopped probably quite a few times over the years. Maybe for a week, maybe maybe for a couple of years, maybe for a month, maybe just for a few days. And you've already experienced the... The physical feeling of maybe having a little bit more energy. Mentally it might not have been a good place to be. But physically, almost immediately you you can get a sense of feeling a bit clearer. You know, the lungs feeling a bit, a bit lighter. And that's just natural. You know, if you wake up after maybe eight or nine hours in bed, you haven't had a cigarette, you feel different to how you did when you went to bed, having maybe had your last cigarette of maybe 15 or 20 or more throughout the day. So just having like six or seven hours break from smoking actually can have a beneficial effect to how you physically feel. It also proves that you can go without smoking for quite a long time. Because eight hours or seven hours, it's it's a long time, really. Try and go eight hours during the day without smoking. If you're a smoker, it's practically impossible. It's very difficult to go, you know, to go to work and just be at work all day long without any breaks. Yeah, like that's going to happen. If you're a smoker, you smoke and you're going to need to smoke a few to few during that time. So the fact that we can go eight hours is, I suppose it's useful. If you start thinking about it like that. If you can go 8 hours and you can go 16 hours. If you can do that, you can do 24 hours. If you can do that, you can do 2 days. If you can do that, you can do a week. Blah, blah, blah. So, you know, you could... If you look at it like that, we all know logically, don't we? Don't need someone to tell you that. We all know that actually stopping smoking isn't quite as complicated as we like to think it, you know? Now we've got a train going past. That's nice. Never been so angry. (laughs) Maybe I need a cigarette. Now there's some serious reasons why someone might be listening to this. So forgive me if I'm not being all serious, but you can get that elsewhere. 
you know, I like to keep things light-hearted. I'm not going to, I don't really, I might do a recording where I go all deep and, you know, focus on disease and all that horrible stuff, but I'm not really in the mood for that and it's not very relaxing, is it, to be honest? Plus, we all know that stuff. So this is aimed at non-stupid people. People that don't need to be told that cigarettes are bad for them. People that don't need to be told about the benefits of not, of not smoking. That's what these recordings are for. You know, intelligent people. Now, there's a part of a smoker, it is a bit dumb. And I include myself in that as being, uh, I have smoked in my life. And there is a, a dumbness, which is, you know, the most intelligent people can smoke, but there's a dumbness to it because you're doing something that is just stupid, really. <laughs> and it, and, but we know it. We don't need anyone to call us dumb. We know that we're being dumb. Doesn't mean we're dumb, a dumb dumb. But in that scenario, it's just a really stupid thing to do. But we know that. So you don't need anyone to tell you that. And it's not even an insult because every smoker knows it's a stupid thing to do. Maybe a teenager doesn't realise. Maybe someone that thinks they're going to live forever, early 20s, you know, physically healthy, can still run a marathon even as a smoker. Um... So maybe, you know, some people are not quite in tune with the uh, the stupidity of it. But it doesn't mean you're a stupid person. It just means that you're doing a stupid thing. There's a difference, I do believe. So I don't really class myself as being a, a stupid person. But I've done many, many stupid things over the years. I could write a book about it. So, so like, I think there's this a benefit of giving yourself a break. Just, you know, taking it easy on yourself. Because this whole like, oh, um, we've got to stop smoking and the tension that can be created by that. You know, the conflict of... Wanting to smoke, but not wanting to smoke. Wanting to smoke, but at the same time, not wanting to die early. Uh, wanting to smoke, but at the same time, perhaps not wanting your children to be sitting at your deathbed watching you choke and, um, you know, go into a coma. Yeah, there's, 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 there's conflicts that go on there. I mean, of course, if that is what you want, then carry on smoking. But maybe, you know, stop listening to this because it's not really for you. And uh, if that is what you want, then, well, that is a really stupid person, isn't it? Where you're like, yeah, well, actually, I do want that. I want to die really horribly in a hospital surrounded by my family. Yeah, well, you're, you're an idiot. Go away. Of course, nobody wants that. And I think as a as a smoker, it's quite easy to play that down. Oh, it never happened to me. And hopefully it won't. But, you know, I think if you can, if you can stop because you want to stop, as opposed to wait until a doctor tells you that you got no choice but to stop otherwise you're gonna die um yeah i think it's probably a good choice to do it because you decide i think it's a lot easier in some ways i mean some people are motivated by that if they're told don't drink anymore otherwise one more drink and your liver will just completely fail and you will die. 
most people would stop drinking there and then. But not everyone. Some people, that will drive them to the to drink even more. And I've seen that, unfortunately. One person particularly, and, and he's dead. He's, he died. And his complete failure of the liver told he had to stop drinking. He didn't. Told he had six, what, three months to live. But he could have longer if he stopped drinking. He didn't. And when he did stop drinking, he died. Just as he decided to stop drinking because he was so ill. He was he passed away shortly afterwards. But he might have lived longer, he might have had more time with his family and but he just he couldn't stop. And I think with smoking, it, it it makes sense to to stop smoking before getting to that point. I know someone that I helped them with anxiety going into hospital to have both their lungs transplanted. So she was told that she had to stop smoking, and she still smoked for two years. At this point, she didn't need a lung transplant. But after the two years, she did need a lung transplant. So she had serious lung disease of some kind. And that's one of those things, because if it is your go-to place, when you get bad news... So if you're if you're a drinker and you get bad news then you're probably going to go and have a drink or you if you're a smoker you'll have a smoke or if you take drugs you'll take you go and have some drugs that's if so if that's a person's go to place so when someone gets told that they have liver failure and they can have to stop drinking or they'll, you know, they'll only have six months left. What do they do? They go to places to drink. Or if someone gets told you've got to stop smoking because you've got lung disease. They go to places a cigarette. Or someone with drugs again, same kind of thing. You know, if you keep smoking or keep taking these drugs, you're gonna die. So they take more drugs to help them cope with it. And it's not, this isn't um, judgment because I've done, I guess I've done the equivalent in the past. Not quite to that extreme. I've never been told that I'm about to die or anything. But I've been told I've got to stop drinking and I've got, you know, went and had a drink to cope with it. And I was told to stop smoking many times. And some of you might be thinking, we just get on with it, we are. If by the way, if anyone's thinking, get on with it, just this is <laughs> this is how I do things. So I know some people would prefer to just uh, me talk, do the hypnosis, and get on with it, and you know stray away, no introduction, no blah blah blah. Not how I do things. I do things a little bit different. And it's not for everyone. Well maybe maybe it is for everyone, but it's not. I take my time. But the thing is, even though I'm talking and you may think, well, this is a smoking session. Why are you talking about alcohol and drugs? Well, there are comparisons, are there not, to that weirdness of 
needing to stop something, but maybe not wanting to, because it's enjoyable perhaps. And people smoke, take drugs, drink alcohol quite often because they like doing it. They enjoy doing it. Now, there's a there's a big. I think there's a misconception in the public forum or whatever, which, in order to to prevent or to, you know, dissuade people from drinking or taking drugs or smoking, is to say that uh, everyone that does that stuff does it because they have to do it. And they're addicted and they feel awful if they don't take, if they don't do it. Well, yeah, that is the case in many people. But also in, the, in many people, the case really is simple as this, they enjoy doing it. They enjoy smoking or drinking or drugging, whatever you want to call it. They do it because they enjoy it. Some people do it because they're addicted and they feel awful if they don't do it. And with alcohol, I used to volunteer at a charity and people that were drinking in excess, you know, excess amounts were told not to stop. Not to stop until they'd been seen and, you know, to gradually cut down. Otherwise, they could end up having a seizure or worse. If they were drinking excessive amounts. Which quite often alcoholics are. Now, I never used to, I've never been an alcoholic. But I was alcohol dependent for years and years and years. What's the difference? Well... I just used to drink every single day for years and years and years. But I wasn't an alcoholic as far as I didn't drink huge amounts and I didn't um, have withdrawal symptoms if I stopped. It was just a coping mechanism to deal with stress, to deal with work and to deal with just boredom, I think. And, yeah, I enjoyed it at times. I don't drink at all now. Again, you may say, but this is about smoking. What are you talking about alcohol for? It's the same process, really. It's the same. It's one of those things like alcohol and cigarettes. The two things they've got in common. Well, a lot, they've got lots in common. Both unhealthy for you. Alcohol has an easier ride than smoking in some ways. First of all, alcohol is still advertised on telly. It's a sociable thing. It's connected to Christmas. To It's, it's almost um, pushed upon us from birth. Like the out drinking alcohol is normal. It's almost abnormal not to drink alcohol, at least in my country. Now, smoking has a bad press all the time. Can't advertise cigarettes. And, you know, it's... But the, but the comparisons they there are is... You can get it easy. You can get them. You can buy cigarettes pretty much anywhere. You know, garages, petrol stations, uh, shops supermarkets, off licenses, news agents. You can even get them delivered, you know, from uh, online delivery, supermarkets and stuff. So it's very easy, as is alcohol, to buy. Now, if you're trying to stop heroin or crack or stuff, it's not as easy to get hold of. You can't just go to the local, pet, you know, petrol station and buy some crack. Unless you know the person that works there. And they're a crack dealer I guess. So it's a bit different. In a sense of. If you're trying to stop drinking alcohol. It's 
very hard when you're surrounded by it. Every time you go and buy food, you walk past shops and adverts on television. It's a a difficult one to kind of avoid. Cigarettes, although not advertised, you know they're there. And you've got people walking through the streets smoking. And you see people in movies and see the TV shows smoking and you know, so it's it's there. But what I noticed something happens inside your brain. And it's a weird one. It's a weird kind of thing where you don't know why. But you just don't want to do it anymore. It's almost like you wake up and you don't have those urges that you had before. You don't enjoy, you know, you know, like the first cigarette of the day. Uh, or cigarettes after having something to eat, or after making sweet love. They, for some reason, stop being enjoyable. And whatever connection you may have had before with smoking almost seems to have It's like that connection, that bridge is just being blown up. The bridge isn't there anymore. There's a big crevice and you can't get over it. But you kind of can't be bothered to get over it. Because maybe unlike previous times when you stopped smoking, when it was such a big deal and you made it a big deal and you told everyone and it was just all you thought about all the time. When your mind just changes and that part of your brain almost switches off, that tiny part of the brain which used to be excited by smoking a cigarette or a roll-up or a cigar or whatever else, a pipe, whatever you stop in. It just switches off. And you can't manually switch it back on. It's almost as if the person in charge of that part of your brain has just turned it off, locked the cabinet with the key so you can't get to actually turn it back on. And they've just not only gone home, but they've quit the job and they've gone. And no one knows how to get back into that cabinet, that locked cabinet. Because he's took the key with him. But he's not coming back because he doesn't work there anymore. Because, well, let's face it, it's a bit of a crap job, isn't it? Imagine all you do all the time is just sit there. Switching on that little craving button every now and then. But that craving button's been turned off. And I was like, oh, what the hell? So I guess the next thing to do is like, let's try and get into there with a crowbar. Can't do that. It's not working. I know. We'll use a bomb. So put a bomb right next to it. Obviously, make get out of the way, ignite the bomb to blow up that cabinet so you can get to the key to switch it on. Now that works, which is good. 
you know, obviously, oh, brilliant. Get back to that that little that little knob so I can switch it back on again. Then you get there. Yeah, the cabinet's open. But that whole area is destroyed now. It's been blown up. This there is no knob, no key, no switch. It's gone. What? It's gone. Well, how are we supposed to activate it if it's gone? We can't. That's annoying. So what now? We could say, well, ah, what we could do, we could find get someone to verbally say to you in your mind to do that thing that you don't have the craving for. So, okay. So if you get someone um, to say, oh, smoke a cigarette or something like that. Okay, good. Well, that's, that's a way to do it. It's not quite the same as the switching a button on and having that, that like, uh, the need maybe that was there because obviously we can't have that anymore because that's gone. But we can maybe try to do an equivalent. I'm trying to help here, so let's think of an idea. So the brain agrees, okay, yeah, okay. You can have you can have that. We'll employ someone else, but just their voice to say to you every now and then at random times to you know have a go on have a cigarette. But the caveat, and this is the punch, this is the this is the nipple twist of it all. The person has to be the voice of someone that you absolutely really, really dislike. I was gonna use the word hate, but that might be too strong. But yeah, hate, that's it. Someone that you cannot stand. And it doesn't have to be someone that you know in person. It could be a, a celebrity that you just can't stand the sound of. Just makes your skin crawl when you think of them. Or someone in your real life. Who it might be a family member. Someone that you really, really disrespect. And you wouldn't do anything that they told you to do. In fact, you'd do the opposite, if anything. You would never take direction or instructions from that person not in a million years because you don't respect them you don't like them you don't trust them and you would not have to do anything that they told you to do never ever ever because that person disgusts you and you uh, ugh, just their voice just makes you feel ugh. now that's the person that's now got the job to tell you to smoke Oh, I see a little bit of conflict there. So, just imagine that person saying, <laughs> saying to you, go on, have a cigarette. Or, you must have a cigarette. you got to have a cigarette. Go and light one up now. In their voice, in that voice that you can't stand. Uh, that I might might be a whiny yeah, have a cigarette and that moany whiny hateful voice <laughs> make it as uh, extreme as you like but that person that you you don't want their voice in your head you really don't because it's going to upset you and it's going to feel horrible horrible so you you got the option you can choose not to have that voice in your head or you can choose to have them telling you to smoke and that's the it's the two choices you got on that one so you can just say get out no 
no, you're not going to be inside my head. Nope, not going to happen. No, 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 no. Get out and stay out. So that could be your personal opinion on that. Or you might think, well, although I can't stand that person, if they help me to to smoke, then that's a good, I'll keep them there. Because that's if that's the only way you're going to be able to have any kind of motivation or interest in smoking, then maybe you have to have them inside your vo- inside your head with that voice telling you what to do. That person you can't stand, and maybe the reason you can't stand them is because they are controlling. And they have been in the past and maybe have caused you lots of problems with their controlling behavior. And when you hear them say something, you just want to do the opposite. It does bring up a bit of a, a difficult situation, doesn't it? I mean, it doesn't bother me because it's not my head and it's not my voice and I don't have to do it. So it's a choice. And it's a choice, a weird choice that no one, pretty sure is guaranteed, no one has ever mentioned anything like this to you before. This is an original idea. Dun, dun, dun. Original? Surely not. As far as I know. So, imagine that voice. Just talking inside your head. Of course, when you imagine a voice, you imagine the person, and you start to feel the way you feel when you think about them, and as if they were in you know, in person there with you and all the baggage and the emotional connection and the negativity connected to that person from the past. You really want that in your mind. You really want that voice taking control of the smoking habit really want that voice telling you what to do no I didn't think so the thing though is when changes happen when you haven't had to do anything I'm lazy I'm a very 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 lazy person I mean, I wouldn't even wash myself if I didn't have to. Honestly, I'm so lazy. I'm annoyed I have to wipe my own bum. Honestly, I'm the laziest person in the world. So, I prefer things to happen naturally. That's one of the benefits of hypnosis is it's not quite perhaps how you expect it to be when you're, you know, you might feel, oh, is this going to be where someone tells me what to do and blah, blah, blah. And yeah, it can be that. But there's other ways that your mind is affected by what you hear. By the words spoken. And because I'm so lazy, I really love when I don't have to do anything for changes to occur. So the idea of being able just to listen to some random weirdo like myself just talking on for an hour seemingly about nothing like oh that's a pointless hour what what did I I'm never going to get that time back but then something changes and you start to notice that 
you're feeling different about things. And maybe not just about the old cigarette situation. Maybe you notice that you start to feel more confident about yourself. More confident within yourself. More confident with your own thoughts and your thinking and your own ability to do certain things. And maybe you start to, to look into the future, which is something that a lot of smokers perhaps don't do so much because, you know, long-term future, let's be honest, might not happen. Um, so you might notice that you're starting to think about things that you can do Start to kind of make plans. Maybe not like cement plans, writing down on paper and discussing it with everyone. But you might start to you know, fantasize about things that you can do. Fun things. Whether it be holidays or changes to your employment. Or changes to your family. Starting to look at. Starting to just observe. That you are thinking differently. There's something changed. And there's, there's like a calmness. That follows you around. This that might surprise you actually, because in the past, maybe when you stop smoking, there's that tension and but that's because you're kind of going against yourself. That's because in the past you stopped doing something that you didn't want to stop doing. And effort, all that effort and that willpower, you know, willpower, man, it's, it's not easy. But what is easy is when your mind almost seems to just make up the decision for itself and we are quite often a slave to our thoughts we kind of do what we think about hugely affected by our thoughts although we can hugely affect our thoughts so what we do affects our brain and our brain affects what we do you know it's the brain and the body are connected I like to say, you know, it's that little thing called a neck. It connects it all. The head and the body. It's not separate. It's not a different land mass. It's all part of the same thing. And the mind, of course, connected. It's seemingly separate, but so powerful. The thoughts we have are so powerful. And it's amazing how the brain works. How changes can happen in an instant. It's almost like with a car. Or like a, you can have like the biggest electrical item. I don't say item, I mean, it could be a plane, it could be a car, it could be a tank, it could be a, a supercomputer, whatever. But you, you, you did 
disconnect something, you go inside and you you make a tiny little change and you can shut the whole thing down just by disconnecting something or removing one tiny little bit. Like with a, excuse me, with a plane, removing one of the wings, but that's not really a tiny bit, is it? But by removing one little bit, you could shut down the whole thing. Or by changing one thing, you can transform the way that that thing works. So maybe it wasn't working fully. Because some may say that the urge to do something that's unhealthy is a fault. Yeah, it's a faulty brain in a way. Which I think is very harsh and unfair. There's no, our brains are not faulty. They're just, I suppose if you think about, it's kind of like a little virus, you know, I guess. Is, if you think about our brains as computers, and these little viruses get in, and they only affect one tiny little bit. They don't mess the whole thing up. So because it only affects one tiny little bit, you don't bother doing antivirus software, maybe you don't bother rebooting or anything, you just put up with it. You know, maybe one key on the keyboard doesn't work. You don't chuck the computer away. But if you rebooted and put, you know, did a diagnostic, so you could probably fix the problem. But it might be a key that you never use. You know, it might be an open bracket key. And like, well, I never use that anyway. Or the Alt-GR key. And you think, oh, no, I don't use that. So it doesn't make any difference. And I think sometimes our brains get a little bit like that. These tiny little viruses maybe that get in and which could be due to suggestion or just social social norms these days or a habit forming and because it doesn't really affect us that much we just put up with it when actually it can be just extinguished and changed and deleted in an instant just by rebooting or doing a diagnostic or maybe sometimes I think with the mind just by relaxing and giving yourself a little bit of space a little bit of time to just sit down and not do anything, maybe listen to someone like me just talking. And for some reason, miraculously, your brain makes the decision to change that one thing. Maybe to delete it, transform it, hide it just blow it up so just it's destroyed that one tiny particle is gone which means the whole network the neural pathways are no longer operational just in the same way as a, an electrical current once broken can't you can't do anything with it until it's reconnected it can't do anything is absolutely useless unless it's connected. It's amazing the amount of power that's there. And once it's disconnected, you know, a wire is broken or cut or whatever, destroyed, the whole thing doesn't work. But you put those two wires together again. And it could be running the entire uh, 
train underground network. But then pull the wires apart, everything shuts down, stops working. But in this case, it's just one thing, one operation that's been disconnected. But it's not been disconnected, really. It's just naturally, changes happen naturally. I think it's more fun when it's natural because it's confusing and it's new and it's fresh. But it's weird because, you know, when you wake up and you don't feel the same as you did before. You don't have the same urges as you did before about that particular subject. And, you know, you have your breakfast and almost you're not even thinking about anything else. You're just enjoying maybe your breakfast and if you have a cup of tea or a cup of coffee, orange juice, I don't know, a coconut, I don't know whatever you're drinking. And it's almost as if there's a, like, where's the thought? Where is it? But it's not there anymore. Why is it not there? Where's it gone? Where's that urge? Where's that, that a feeling that used to, used to feel like a need, like I have to, but now it's almost like just not there. It's a, a non-feeling. And there's a calmness that can come from that. A real looseness. A real kind of... You know, that, that sense of Oh, this feels nice for no reason. Just, oh, I feel relaxed. It's nice. And the breathing, the, the relaxation of your lungs and the ability to breathe deeply But really, really relaxed. It's a nice, it's a nice feeling. It's just a comfortable, pleasant, almost meditative experience. And those positive thoughts. To stop, start to pop up. As positive thoughts. As happy feelings. Become stronger. And even when a negative thought pops up, it's almost like all the positive stuff just pushes it out of the way. It's almost like while you're asleep, the, suddenly you've got all these really randy, horny, positive thoughts all reproducing while you're asleep. And you're waking up and there's loads of them there all running around in your mind thinking about nice things. Thinking about the th things that you can do. Noticing the things that you're good at. Maybe remembering nice 
experiences and memories and starting to want to plan a happy future. Feelings like gratitude may start to arise. And the ability to just sit down, close your eyes, even if it's just for a few seconds, and immediately have that sense of comfort, calmness and well-being. Almost as if the whole world slows down instantly. And your body and your mind relaxes. Instantly. And it's a nice feeling. To just have those kinds of changes. And just to happen naturally. Without any effort whatsoever is I think quite cool because as I said I'm lazy I I can't be bothered to put a lot of effort into making changes for myself so to have that degree of trust in your own mind as well I guess is having respect for yourself realising that your mind has been looking after you your entire life. And you can maybe start to appreciate yourself and those amazing qualities that you have. Now, I guess that brings us to the end of this recording. Of course, if you're listening with music, the music will continue for however long the recording lasts. And over the next few hours... Some ideas, thoughts, changes start to absorb into your brain, your mind and starts to make changes at the real core level of your existence. All positive. All positive and you can enjoy just knowing that you didn't have to do anything you can just allow those positive healthy healing changes to naturally occur Within yourself. Even though it's happening anyway. You can still give it your blessing. Feeling calm. Loose and relaxed. Letting go of everything. And I'll speak to you again.
with another recording. And take care of yourself. Lots of love.